Good evening. I'm Alex Nunez, Senior Governance and Scrutiny Officer at Milton Keynes City Council. And our first order of business is to elect the Chair of the Committee for the Council Year 2024. I understand that the political groups agree to defer election of the Chair until the next meeting. So on that basis, can I have a proposed and a seconder to defer the election of the Chair until the next meeting? Thank you. Are we agreed? Agreed. Uh, in that case, the election chair has been deferred to the next meeting of the committee, and I understand that the vice chairs have agreed that Captain Petchy will take the chair for tonight's meeting. Are we all happy with that course of action? Yeah. Thank you. In that case, I'll hand over to you, Captain Petchy. Yeah. Move chair here. I'm seeing some more people now. Right. Well, thank you very much for your vote of confidence. Um, Welcome to the meeting of the Environment and Place Scrutiny Committee. Um, for the benefit of those who are going to view this on video, I'm Councillor Pecci, Martin Pecci. I'm the one of the vice chairs of the committee. Um, as I said, this, e this evening's meeting is being recorded and it will be on the council's YouTube channel uh, in the next couple of days. Uh, we aren't expecting a fire alarm. Um, but in the event that the alarm sounds, don't panic, exit the building by the nearest marks exit and assemble outside as Alex will, will guide you. And um, so on to the business of the meeting. Um, any apologies, Alex? Yes, Chair. So we received apologies from Councillor Whitworth, who is substituted by Councillor Kendrick and Councillor Rex Exxon will be substituting for the vacant Liberal Democrat seat. Right, so uh, now if people could introduce themselves, that would be good. Um, start on my left. I'm um, Councillor Alison Andrew, and Vice Chair of this committee. Councillor Tracy Bailey, a um, member of this committee. Councillor Sue Smith, and I'm a member of this committee. Councillor Jenny Fairmans, I'm a member of the committee. Councillor Mo Han, member of this committee. Councillor Leo Monsky, member of the committee. Panther Dan Gendrick's Central Milton Keynes, substituting for Debbie Whitworth um, from Olney. Councillor Tony Yakari, member of this committee. Councillor Rex, excellent, a substitute. Councillor Graham Eaton, member of this committee. I think, I think that's, that's all of us, isn't it? So now the officers. Alex and then, yeah. Alex Media, Senior Government and Scrutiny Officer, Milkey City Council. Good evening, Stuart Crawford, uh, Director of Environment and Property. Good evening, uh, Nicholas Hannon, uh, AD Environment and Waste. Hello, I'm Ben Fox, I'm the Waste Services Client Manager. I'm Environment and Commissioning Program Manager. Very good. That I think concludes the introductions. Um, then on to item four, disclosures of interest. Uh, councillors must declare any disposable pecuniary interests or personal interests, including other pecuniary interests they may have, and officers to disclose any interest they may have in any contracts to be considered. So are there any interests to be declared? No. Um, the minutes have been circulated, that is the minutes of the meeting of the 12th of September. Um, are they agreed? Agreed. Okay, right. In that case, I will sign them later. Um, and then before we move on to the business, um, the Satanti of business, um, I'd like to propose how that we look at the meeting tonight. Um, item six to nine, or broadly relate to the implementation and the first year experience of the new waste and environment contract, whereas item 10 is something quite separate. So um, um, in order to expedite business and to make things discussion quite coherent, um, Alice and I have agreed that for item six to nine, each item will be briefly introduced by the officers um, and then um, members will be invited or I will invite members to submit questions of clarification of fact 
um, and then we'll do each for six or nine, and then we'll have a broader discussion at the end, um, covering all the topics discovered and, and how we found um, the, the new contract and things you want to feedback, recommendations you want to make to country, to the cabinet. Um, and then we'll move on separately to item 10, um, so that that will be introduced, um, question of education, and then discussions of debate. Um, I don't think we've, we've got any members of um, Nigel to, to come in, have we? So, no, sure. Um, I do, just before we'll go on, just have a, a point. Um, I'm slightly concerned we've got a technical issue that the, uh, the meeting is actually being recorded. So I'm going to try and get some variety, if you don't mind, um, because obviously at the minute I think what we've got is we've got audio, we don't have anything visual, because on there there's a picture of the, the meeting room on the screen. So if you could post an adjournment for five minutes, I want to make sure that everyone who's not in the room can actually see this, and then uh, we'll continue from there. Right. Is, that, is the adjournment five minutes agreed? <laughs> Sorry, I didn't see you there about the winter charge. I had a choice tonight. I got in and out through. Oh, no, he didn't. I saw. Unfortunately, he got two darts. Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, we'll get the two darts. Okay. You just turn it on. Yeah, she said it on. I don't know why it wasn't on, but I wanted to make sure before we go anywhere. I'm told we're good to go. So we we, we now have um, visual as well as audio recording happening. So we can start again. So right on to item six, the environmental services and the report. Is that much you need? Off you go. Thank you, Chair. Um, good evening, members of the committee. Um, I'll be presenting uh, four items uh, together. And what I hope to do is to give a brief summary of the contents of the report so that we can uh, engage thereafter. So essentially, the first item is the Environmental Services Annual Report. This is a first for us, um, following a series of previous scrutiny sessions, it was decided and agreed that there would be greater overall transparency of data and information provided for the new Environmental Services contract, which is the Council or one of the Council's Premier Frontline Service Provision contracts. Uh, what we've aimed to do is provide a broad range of information related to the service. Uh, what is not included, what is not in scope here, is landscape services, grounds maintenance, burials, uh, and any of the green service provision, trees related, uh, and equally none of the street cleansing services and river cleansing services are included either. This is purely a focus on uh, the waste collection services. Um, so what we've wanted to do is um, just uh, note that uh, the health and safety approach that's been adopted by our new environmental services contractor Suez uh, has been highly, uh, very positive. Uh, we've seen low levels of accidents and resulting lost days, 71 days lost as a result of accidents, but 60 days linked to the single incident and the remaining five accidents linked to 11 working days. And we must acknowledge and ask scrutiny to recognise that the waste industry is the most dangerous industry in the country, uh, more than the construction industry and more than the agricultural industry. Um, I think that there are quite a large number of associated fatalities within the industry and that health and safety should always be front and centre of the sector, given the, uh, the number of uh, unfortunate incidents that do occur. We've seen an increase in the leadership um, and the provision of management uh, within the new environmental services contracts, we have seen an increase in the number of level of supervisors, an increase in the amount of management that, that the that prior to where there was with the legacy contractor. And um, we have seen a dedicated HR management, dedicated health and safety management and business improvement management now placed in site within Milton Keynes. So previously, uh, the legacy contractor had that remotely, uh, was delivered as a, as a portal function, but Suez have taken it upon themselves to deliver that function within Milton Keynes of dedicated access, which has been able to enable the team to be able to expedite some of the issues that they would have encountered. 
The new contract and the new service also delivers a new tripartite arrangement uh, where we engage directly with the unions. Previously, the council was not interfaced necessarily on union engagement. We have to remember there are over 350 staff that work on this contract. So now we have Milton Keynes Council, the unions, uh, primary GMB, uh, and the environmental services contractors who meet in a tripartite meeting. So we can understand where the staff are with their concerns. We can understand where the unions are and trying to wish them raise the issues that they wish to discuss that we've had several meetings so far and that is chaired by the portfolio program so they're very much a visible council presence now and trying to understand pay increases union deals inflation things like that moving on to performance <clears throat> we um i'd like to reflect on the fact that when we went through the environmental services procurement one of the contractors who shall not be named um a very large contractor said that rolling out wheel bins and deploying a new contract and delivering new vehicles at the same time and making sure that they're powered by the electricity that's generated by your power plant is too much. We're out. Suez said we can do it. So I just want to remember that obviously the transition from us having our SAC system and if we all remember all council meetings regarding the status of our waste fleet, the transition that we've undertaken has been quite significant. That said, there are three major incidents that have occurred throughout year one. Um, which are the cessation of collecting side waste. Remember that people could put out as much waste as they liked by their wheel bins. Um, an issue with uh, the suspension of a Euro driver in June 2024. So for those of you that have Euro bin collections within your properties, uh, within your wards, there would have been some changes and some challenges there. And then uh, managing the summer sickness and annual leave issue, which this report details and explains the challenges and why they were found. So the issues are sort of reflected upon across communal waste, across recycling, across garden waste, and they all largely equalise out as there being a spike in miscollections over the June, July, August period. Now, what we've also tried to include as an annex to this first item is what a recovery plan looks like. So immediately when something does start to happen, there is an immediate call for what are we going to do about it? So now uh, the, there are recovery plans that are brought on board quite quickly, and you can see and quite quickly understand how resources are remobilized to focus on the primary you know, collections of the black wheel bins and either the red or the blue wheel bins. Um, what we've seen is the operation has managed to consistently maintain uh, collections um, and um, a regular 99.95% collection rate. Um, and when we start to see failure, it usually impacts on around about 0.02% variation. So it can lead to a, a spike, but that spike against the wider wider collection is can be sort of covered as quite small. However, it doesn't necessarily feel like that because obviously it, these things become logarithmic quite quickly and the pressure that becomes applied can become quite large. Um, We've seen uh, across recycling collections, um, the blue, um, you know, I've got on 5.3, we've got uh, the blue bar reflecting the number of missed collections, um, and that we generally use the performance indicator of 100 missed bins per 100 collections. Uh, anything above that is deemed to be unacceptable. So what we expect is a 99.99 performance rate, 99.99% performance rate in terms of our collections. Uh, and this is reflected on the corporate scorecard. So every month, if it's less than 50, it's green. 50 to 100 is amber, but more than 100 is red. I also just wanted to sort of bring uh, the committee's attention to assisted collections. Okay, this was an area that we wanted to focus on in the new contract. Uh, what we have seen is there is a focus, and, and uh, David will talk about the performance management framework, but we do miss bins. A missing bin once is okay. Missing bin a second time is a problem. A third time is a big problem. I don't even want to think about fourth time, and that's for a fifth time, well, that's not great. With assisted collections, there is a ratchet mechanism in the performance management framework, as there is for all of the collections, to make sure that we do pick up missed bins for those residents that have assisted collections, and that what it's meant to do is it's meant to drive the resources, but where they've noticed the service failure, that they collect and make sure they collect it the following week. And that means a very rapid turnaround of information. We need to make sure that we've understood that there's been a missed collection, that we've not been able to rectify it within 24 hours as per the contract, and that we are going to try and make sure we get the next collection the following week. 
that information comes through us in a myriad of ways, customer services, counselor casework, direct interfacing. So that uh, 5.19 is demonstrating there has been a focus on reducing the number of assisted collections that have been repeat missed. And as you can see in September 23, it started at 69 and we missed 19 again and then eight again for the third time. But by August 24, yes, we missed 86, but we missed two, we missed 11 twice and then we've missed two throughout the third time. So it's driven down our repeat missed collections and councillors will understand and recognise it is the repeat missed collections that, become, that drive the agitation and the frustration. Um, Moving on to our sort of our trend line information, we've seen reductions across you know all of our missed collections for repeat mix, which has been important. So overall, um, you know, the, we, we what we wanted to note was there's been a significant uplift in the health and safety culture and leadership presence in the new environmental services contract. Um, the next item will cover the, the episodes of poor performance and the drivers that drove those, and equally the reasons. Also, some wider considerations for scrutiny to, to think about as to what's happening there. The use of information technology, which is the following item after that, had rapidly evolved, and that's helping us provide greater, more insightful information to councillors and their inquiries. Uh, and the additional cost to maintain service provision have been absorbed by the contractor. And item nine will demonstrate the effectiveness of the performance management framework. So, in the next item, we will start to look at the benefits of why it was that we decided to outsource the service and how, how it's having these accountable standards have driven um, the contractor to absorb that additional cost that's required to maintain those standards. Okay, the following item, if that's okay. Well, can we pause for questions on this one? I think, uh, Chair, would it be okay to finish this item, this, this next item, because the two are interlinked? The, okay. So if that's okay, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, the, the following item, waste collection service challenges and lessons learned. Um, we had uh, an issue in July, um, oh sorry, this is the next item, I'm sorry, this is the scrutiny reports, waste collection services, challenges and lessons learned, council, sorry, yes, yes, so we're skipping this, sorry, yes, sorry, I'm not, page 33, if anybody else sees it, sorry, I'm not, we're on the same page now, <laughs> thank you. In July 2024, we had some Eurobin collections issues. So Eurobins are our communal containers that are collected from, um, from flats and apartments. Um, this was driven by a joint investigation by our environmental crime and waste services team working with housing services. Uh, and we had, as a result of that, we had to take um, some severe action that was actually led to the disciplining of that team and their resulting dismissal. Um, it's been felt that the the way that this was managed was the most appropriate way to manage the seriousness of the issue. Um, and what transpired was that the information that was contained within the individual's heads had not been transposed into a legible format for anyone else who needed to step in. Um, there is quite a lot of information that has resided within our waste collection operatives in the driver's heads for a long time. And the legacy contractor worked to do what they could to transpose it into a formats for the new contractor, but essentially this was an area that was not mapped and provided information. So as a result of that, when a new team came in, they were not able to pick up the exact locations, where everything was, the appropriate times to go there, when to avoid the schools, all of these sorts of things. So we saw a spike of uh, increases of, of miscollections as a result of that. Um, the data relating to the service was not held in the system, it was retained by the driver, and the inbuilt knowledge by the driver they knew that the emptying patterns of the euro bins. So to remedy this, um, what's happened now is all of the bin locations are now being stored corporately on our mapping system. All of the flat locations are mapped and differentiated by SAC or bin collections. They know when to go where. And all the flats have got a hybrid collection system that have been reviewed and they're either going to be SACs or bins. So quite a major change there. Um, we've also been able to look at the curbside collection issues. So. This was slightly different, so this wasn't resulting in disciplinary action. This was uh, an event which led to uh, um, an increase in the number of occurrences of absence, pattern absence, as it's called. So absence on a Monday, absence on a Friday, you start to pattern that out, and then you start to get an idea about what the actual issues are here. And so the monthly trend of refused holiday requests and subsequent absences 
we can start to see there become a spike from May through to June through to July. So what we had was uh, the surge were driven by planning for summer holidays by staff. The legacy contractor had not actually previously managed the staff to say, <clears throat> unfortunately, unlike many of many standard roles, um, where there will see a spike in annual leave in May, in March, we'll see a spike in annual leave over Christmas. Uh, in various times in waste services, you always have to have 60 drivers, you always have to have 180 loaders. So that means that the number of available leave that can be taken um, is, is actually quite short. So it says here, um, previous resource deployment of 57 drivers and 110 loaders is, is required to deliver services. Now, the moment that it goes over that number, um, we start to lose rounds. We can absorb the loss of two or three drivers and we can reallocate to other rounds. But beyond that point, it starts to impact here. So you can start to see the number of drivers on holiday, the higher it is, and the number of drivers off sick. Um, we can start to have a, quite a serious impact on our waste collection services. And so, people taking off leave, planned, unplanned, for summer holidays, parental care, legacy contractor management, you know, and management of the staff, we had a surge in the number of rounds that were available. We weren't able, we had the vehicles, but we didn't have the pilots, so to speak, so we weren't able to deploy. So that forward forecast of issues associated with round deployment is certainly something which who is now using to engage with the workforce so that in advance there is a very robust approach to holiday management. But equally, um, we've had to try and recognise that the number of days lost for sickness are increasing. Um, so we've seen um, instances where July and August um, losing six drivers and 11 loaders and then annual leave on top of that can create quite a strain on the service. So we see an increase in the monthly average absences across that area. Um, we've also seen a number, an increase in the number of leavers because um, the, I would say that with the tighter management regime, uh, that has led to an increased number of leavers per month. And in July, we saw 15 leavers in August and 10 leavers, which was the highest of. of. And we've seen. Um, in the first 12 months, 102 staff left Suez uh, and 90 of them had service of less than six months. And you'll start to see this being becoming an issue within the waste collection service, not just here, but across the industry. So what have we done to, uh, what Suez has done to manage the issue? And they've actually, uh, a comprehensive programme of recruitment of agency workers, uh, an expedition of training of agency staff, and then moving them through onto their process of um, adopting them. And um, we've got much better analysis of trends to understand and mitigate the impact of such absences. So we have seen that drivers are the key and the resilience of ensuring that drivers are turning up and being available as and when they're supposed to be available is crucial. Having that resilience if there are some of the sick. Um, I just wanted to highlight as well um, the workforce. Okay, we don't really, and this is the first time I've spoken about the workforce, uh, the waste collection workforce, and where we are as a sector and where we are moving to at the moment. So, the scrutiny issues of 35% of the sickness is assigned to the 30 to 44 year bracket, and 17% of the sickness is in the bracket of 20 to 24 years. We are not seeing necessarily people coming into the sector. It is a challenging job. It can be quite hard. It is an early start. You work the full day and there is a challenge across the whole waste collection sector where as a result of migrating to wheeled bins, we were able to deploy more vehicles and to absorb the growth of the city. But we continue to grow. We are going to need more people to move more waste collection receptacles. And that is going to be a challenge. Uh, and that's certainly something where even when we go through the agencies, it's about trying to retain staff, trying to retain drivers. And then just finally, um, beyond um, the challenges that we've seen there, um, we've also, the sector resourcing, the age of the workforce, the demand from other sectors. The other thing that I just wanted to touch on briefly was the cost. So all of the management, the additional cost, trying to maintain the performance, 
being able to go out to agency work, bringing extra resources on board, cost the contractor an extra £780,000, which is a significant sum of additional revenue to keep things going. To stay within that performance management framework that David will talk about shortly, um, they spent the best parts of over three quarters of a million pounds. Now, those challenges, if we were delivering the services, would be our challenges. So the fact, again, that we have worked to procure the best value contractor through the competitive procurement process, and then by having a firm contract management program, has meant that in order to keep those services moving within those levels of performance, those additional costs had to be absorbed by the contractors. Now, it will be, as we move on to the, the next section, looking at that balance of punitive performance management frameworks against all of the unseen extra costs that the contractor has to spend to keep that performance. And what we don't want is for that behaviour to potentially drive the wrong number. So they start to do things which are driven by financial savings or everything like that, rather than staying on cost. So that's a very important point that I wanted uh, the committee to be aware of, all of those additional costs that are being absorbed on by the contractor in order to keep that performance. Um, and I think that that is the summary of the environmental services contract for year one. I believe that there is an expectation that uh, there will be a review of year two. Um, and those were the three major incidents within waste collection services. In January 2024, we did touch on the mobilisation of the wheeled bin service, so I wasn't expecting to present anything regarding that. So this is more about business as usual and what the, is where the sector is going in terms of staff and support. Thank you, Ken. Right, thank you, Nick. Um, so, open to questions, and questions rather than comments, please. Thank you. That's a very important report, report, particularly concerning the staff issues and health and safety issues. Um, however, there are a number of reasons for risk collections, and they're not all that the staff don't know the route. Do, one, do you have any KPIs that show the other rules of this? So, things over full, the wrong end, the wrong material in it. Um, can't get to the bin because of blockages in the street, that sort of thing. Because my impression is that at times those are much higher than mm -hmm. they up, they don't know the route, and they need very different solutions. So do you have Thank you, Councillor Barons. Um, do you uh, have some, can you give us some feel for what sort of proportion we're talking about? We, thank you, Councillor Barons. Um, we collect individual missed in data using the onboard computers on the on the vehicles and they will denote where bins and why bins have often been missed where they know have knowingly been missed so for example a street was inaccessible or bin has not been presented and we have seen a, a tremendous reduction in where residents have called up to say you've missed you've missed my bin or you've missed my collection because we've now got an evidence trail of where we've been able to sort of say, well, actually, your bin wasn't out at the time of collection and the next item does pick up on CCTV and tracking and things like that. Uh, obviously, the ones that we don't know are the ones that are unknowingly missed. Uh, and we are trying to understand why those are continuously unknowingly missed, uh, despite the fact that we raised them to. David, did you want to pick up on some of the different missed bin reasons? Yeah, so um, I don't have to hand count for phones, so apologies, but we do collect things what we call exceptions. Which is not a misbid, although it appears a misbid to have read them. There's a genuine reason why the bin hasn't been collected, and they are parked cars, blocked access, there's roadworks going on, the bin wasn't out, the bin contaminated. So I haven't got any much to hand, but it is collected and collated. So, um, oh, sorry, you've got a supplementary. Go on. Go on. So you've talked about what you're doing about the staff, knowledge of the route and so on, issues. What do you do about the others? Because I'm not seeing any tags telling residents that they've got the wrong sort of waste. We're not hearing what you're doing about the problem that the lorries can't get past our cars because that is seems to be a lot worse with this contractor than it was with the old contractor. So 
Yeah, I think with, with things like plant carbon book practice, it takes time. So we will put some people on sacks, we will put them on small bins, we'll find different collection points, we'll shift routes around, time the collection, send some more lorries. Unfortunately, it's not quick, so it can take two or three months the time we've investigated the problem, found out what it is, um, put a solution in place, got it communicated through our ink, had the boss, the driver. So it does take time, but um, those do have bin tags, they can use them. They should be putting them in bins when there's contamination on the site. We do get lots of photos, so when the crews log a contaminated bin, we'll get a photo of what's in that bin. So when a customer phones up um, the involved services helpline, they'll get a, when they talk to somebody, they'll see, get to see a picture of what's in their bins. We can report that back and into a feedback loop to the to the customer if required. Thank you, Alton. Just picking up on that one of Councillor Brown's uh, points, it, it would be really useful to know what happens when there's planned roadworks. And um, there's been a couple of occasions in my ward where there's been planned roadworks, but residents haven't been sure what they should do on their collection things. And, and just because I'm data and Walton on the edge of Milton Keynes, I think to just to add a cut further complication, there's been central beds roadworks that possibly haven't fed through to you that might be impacted on some of our residents on the Milton Keynes side of the road. Um, but that aside, I, I just wanted to say about the, the Christmas collections and how I thought it was a brilliant idea to do the double recycling um, Christmas week. I wondered if there was any scope to um, do that on New Year week as well, or whether potentially that the blue bin waste was... Um, the greater weight that week and maybe start to but who use parties not just my house and um, whether, whether starting starting the new year with a blue bean collection was a good idea although i've just looked in the first of uh first of january is the middle of the week so it's probably not helpful. <laughs> thank you councillor bailey um and thank you for the feedback um it was something where we're obviously clearly we don't want to discourage recycling uh recycling is our premier offering uh, two residents um, and we wanted to ensure it's front and centre post Christmas so that's really helpful feedback actually because we we haven't heard that much feedback I don't think um, so that that's really that's really good to know um, and it's as I mentioned something that we can certainly look at for for the new year uh, and where we are with things like Christmas trees and things like that we just need to think about how we can shape the resource that we have to respond to what we know is coming down in terms of demand, for, particularly for recycling services. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, staffing problem, they go 102 uh, with the first 12 months. Um, others are six months. I mean, so it's a big company, it's a private company, they're taking a contract form. It seems like we're picking up their staff for the staff meetings. Um, Service has been provided, but obviously the contractors know before they take it on, size of the contract, things will go wrong. Um, you know, the ETC are three quarter of a million pounds. Um, so it's a massive company, they should be worried about it, those kind of things when they're coming in. I mean, service has been, I'm sure there's a string chart if he, if they miss so many times, there's a penalty to go around them. Is any, any of them be applied? Thank you, Councillor Khan. Uh, if we will be covering the performance management framework as one of the next items, mm -hmm. which demonstrates how the, the penalties are applied. Um, the We have gone from, I would say, what was a, you know, almost a butter knife to a samurai sword. And so it is much sharper. It was made quite apparent um, that, that some, that, the administration and the authority as a whole wanted to see a much stronger position and i think it's quite right that you know the contractors all of them went in eyes wide open with the pmf um we looked to potentially negotiate it as part of the competitive dialogue process but it was one of the things that was pretty much out of scope because we didn't want to dilute the potency and equally, the, we felt that this was most certainly carrying through the wheel of scrutiny of cabinet. It, there was a very clear consensus on there being a very strong performance management framework. So I completely agree that Suez are aware of the challenges and it's for them to manage workforce issues. And as a result of that, work down and reduce this additional spend that they've had to incur as a result of it. Thank you. Can I just come back on that, Chair? Um, perhaps maybe in the next meeting or, or one after we have somebody from Sweet, you know, with their side of the story. I know you guys do a great job, 
with one of the cities and it is a big complex contract they're doing it. Um, end of the day, you know, our city council picking up the wages and paying for it and taxpayers paying for it. We will be elected to depend on that. So that's what I mean by that. Perhaps we can look around to it more scrutiny next time. Excuse me. Any more questions? Uh, and can I ask one? Uh, Jenny, oh, sorry. Jenny. Um, whilst you're checking that, can I ask mine? And then, um, um, you've highlighted the unattractiveness of, 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 of some of the employment conditions to, to, to a lot of people. Uh, I think it was South Cambridge here. When they went over to a four-day week, they they went over completely, including their refuse collections, and it seemed to work, which offers, as it were, a three-day weekend. Has that ever been sort of uh, in your mind as a possible way to um, retain staff? Thank you, Chair. Uh, it's something that we, we have not considered, but we would be happy to raise that with the contractor to work with an assortment of ways that we can continue to find the sector more attractive. Um, Suez have, as it denoted in the report, done an awful lot around social value, which has been very, very positive, a tremendous amount, actually, in terms of all the work that's been done. Um, and they have been able to do well with graduate apprentices, which has been great in terms of information, IT, data analytics. But I would think that what might be more attractive in terms of since the workforce could be, you know, something like that. So it's certainly something that we will pick up and engage with them, and it could be, you know, quite quite innovative in that respect. So, so thank you. Andy, have you found your place yet? Um, yes, I've got two. I just want to rest away with the thing before the mis collapses comes back to the Still double the range. Thank you, Councillor Ferrins. Uh, we are looking at uh, being a, we feel that we are now able to identify each mist collection. Uh, whereas before, mist collections that were reported was very much a lot of waste sacks which is being placed out. And we weren't able to basically know who had or had not been missed because we, we had clear all. Um, we will look to try and reduce the missed collections around to about 75 per 100,000. Um, we've been trying to look at some benchmarking for other authorities that have wheel bins that are doing very, very well. Um, and, and, and we feel that. I think you're missing, sorry, sorry. I think you're missing the point. I think you're missing the point. In very much it was mm. the 11 it is now. Oh, I see. Yes, I, 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 so, so September we've yeah. seen a significant reduction and we would aim to, to, to this month to pretty much be back at that level. But we have seen a, a significant settling. Okay, my other one was, we've talked about the fact that they can look at the reasons and they can look at the evidence and so on. If they're getting 300 collections a week missed, that's an awful lot of time if they're going to look at all of them. So how do you decide which one to look at and what um, does it take to look at them? Is there any process in noticing that collections have been this time and time again? Mm -hmm. this or, yeah. Yes. Because I've had cases, as you know, where yep. collections have been missed six, eight, ten weeks running. It can be problem with that's actually what was written. Um, Thank you, Councillor Ferris. That we, we have an exceptions list, as David mentioned, where our focus and when we look at the PMF, there is a ratchet mechanism that focuses on basically if you miss one bin one week, nothing. Two weeks, it's equivalent of one point. Three weeks, ten points. Four weeks, a hundred points. So the contractor should and is looking at the aggregation of continuous miscollections. The waste team that we have here are almost a problem solving solutions team who go in and work on with every single councillor on their individual issues. Um, we have a handful of recurring incidents where it seems 
they are very complex. They shouldn't be complex, but some of the situations can be quite complex in terms of where waste is presented, what time it's presented. Um, so we do have that resource as from a client perspective in terms of the, the council that goes out to resolve those. And each councillor has their own waste services officer that works in their various patch. I'm sure you all know who they are. Um, but in terms of how they're being resolved from a contracting perspective, I think that there, need, there, there should be a, a greater proactive reduction in those. Uh, because as I say, they're the ones that cause, it's the 80-20 rule really, isn't it? It's sort of 20% of those issues are causing 80% of the problems for councillors and for us. So that's where we need to be focusing uh, as well. So that's a, that's a helpful indication of where it is we need to be going. Well, obviously the team does tend to, we've had these two spikes over the summer, which was unfortunate yeah. because we would have liked to have been focusing on reducing those recurring ones, but that will be our focus uh, in advance, preparing for Christmas and after into year two. Thank you. Okay, um, you've talked about the problem where residents don't get their waste collected because, for instance, the cargo the line can't get mm -hmm. it for that can happen for weeks at a time. Mm -hmm. It is just not acceptable to have six weeks worth of rubbish in a stretch of road for everybody not collected. That becomes a serious public health hazard. So, what do you do in that situation? Are you actually sending the small lorry out to collect it? And then I know you are when we have been bounced up and down and yell, but surely there should be an automatic escalation to do. Thank you, Councillor. We do have the narrow access vehicle that looks to try and access some of the that accesses those roads as it is a priority. Um, repeat miscollections to the tune of five or six weeks are without a doubt the waste team's highest priority. You know, when, when it gets to that level, it is our focus. David, did you want to sort of comment on that question? Yeah, so there is, a, there is a process where if a crew do log in, no access, they do have to return within 48 hours, and we can see them returning yes. using GPS. So that, that, that is a process should happen. There's, there's a lot more, and I'll speak about the four T's repeatedly, time, tools, second T. The tools available to the crews now. When, a, when there has been a repeated missed, you should flag on a device. So when it's been missed once, you know, they, they go to twice, you should flag it's been repeatedly missed. So the tools are there for the crews. There is now six supervisors, used to be three supervisors on waste collection. So the tools are there for them to get things right. And unfortunately, my team does step in quite often to try and highlight and isolate some of the more problem areas. But say the tools are there, will support the crews. And when I want to speak about the PMF later, there's plenty of disincentivization for them to get it right, believe me. I have to explain why I'm now getting a voice that we missed every other week. <laughs> <laughs> right, well, and there's a question on that. Oh, sorry, I'm sorry, didn't see it. Off you go. Yes, just a quick question again, looking at the um, attrition of staff and the unapproved absences. Um, with the previous uh, company that was used, um, I seem to remember they didn't work on bank holidays, and now these guys do. Um, I wonder if that's a good thing. Are we actually creating a problem? We're making it more unfamily friendly through August and so on, because I know, and it's not scientific at all, but even with some of my friends and where the residents I am, we all kind of feel a bit guilty putting out bins on a bank holiday because you want people to spend time with their family. And it was really never a big burden, just putting your bins out a couple of days later, everybody got with it. So it was just a suggestion if that would help. Thank you, Councillor Andrew. It's uh, yes, just just for the record, we um, there was a union agreement that we would work um, bank holiday Mondays, uh, all, the, all the bank holidays, um, as part of a pay deal that went through with the unions. Um, I think that it's something which, again, we could probably raise at the tripartite meeting, and that would be the appropriate forum for it. And there can be a configuration between the union and the workforce as to if this is causing any any major strife. At the time, it was potentially a convenience because people, you know, claw back their weekends. Um, but yes, because they had the Saturday catch up. But um, it's certainly something that the tripartite is there for us to be able to interface to ask those questions about are people happy with it? Because it was maybe four or even five, four or five years now that, that that went through. So things have certainly moved on. Yeah, I think 
I mean, look at the patterns. They quite often turn up on bank holiday Mondays because double time kicks in. So I don't think it's a um, a disincentive for them to come turn up on that bank holiday Monday. Despite they might want to start having their family to get paid to do so. So I think they're willing to come in for those days. Just again, man. Um, just a quick one. Um, first, it is a massive company. Annual turnover of 23 is 2.7 billion pound share. Um, I'm sure they're fully aware of the scale of us taking the city council and many other boroughs in the UK. So staffing and other stuff, uh, the scale of the company, I'm sure they're aware about it. I'm not challenging anything. I'm just saying we are doing a good job for our city. Mm -hmm. But I'm saying we are performing the companies on the company house is 2.7 billion now. Yeah. I mean, inside of a company taking a job on city council like ours and many other boroughs, they should be able to handle it. But I'm not saying, you know, everything perfect, but we guys working together. We're not here to support the company, but, you know, we're paying them. Yeah. Thank you. Right. So can we then move on to consider um, item eight? Is that you again, Nick? Yes, that's great. Thank you very much. So, um, are you going to look at the euro bins? Because uh, so the euro, so, so sorry, councillor, the the euro bins, uh, euro bin waste collections was an annex to um, the waste collection yeah. uh, services annual report, and it's, yes. it's, 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 you didn't say anything about it. An but, example of how we recovered the plan. Uh, I just provided it in there as an example. It, it wasn't written for this uh, committee to demonstrate and to provide confidence to the committee that when issues are raised regarding spikes and miscollections, that the authority from a contract management perspective mobilises robustly with the contractor put in, a, in place a recovery plan. Um, happy, happy to pick that up in due course. Uh, my item uh, before moving on to David is regarding advancements to resolving waste inquiries and it's to again um, seek engagement with the committee regarding the level of information that is provided. Currently inquiries are raised through council casework or through um, customer services. What we are looking to do is to provide um, technological updates so that councillors can appreciate uh, some of the more detail that we're providing in our inquiries now, we are hoping that not only to say, thank you, councillor, the issue has been resolved, but to also say, thank you, councillor, here's the problem, but here is the evidence to say that we have checked with the contractor. So what we are seeing now is we have got on every single vehicle, we have 360 degree CCTV that records all day. So if there is an incident, and then a whole host of incidents, not necessarily related to waste, we're, we've been able to use this footage, um, there's an example there of a front facing camera on an RCV. So we are able to understand in real time um, waste being placed out, waste being collected, any issues regarding health and safety. I'm afraid to say any issues involving the public, both to their detriment or to the detriment of the contractor. Uh, road rage incidents, traffic incidents, insurance incidents, breaking of walls, hitting of cars, cars hitting us. It really has become uh, an invaluable tool actually for us to uh, not only from a health and safety perspective but also from um, a visibility of service provision. So when you have concerns that are being raised in your walls and there are repeat issues we will and can use and download the CCTV and provide that this, this information to you. We've also now got vehicle tracking uh, which provides what we call a snail trail so you can see where the vehicle's been and often we can demonstrate there has been a, you know, an inquiry of, I haven't seen them, uh, the, the crews haven't been here. We can demonstrate the vehicle has been there. Um, hopefully they've worked to try and access something. So the vehicle has been there. Um, and so we can demonstrate that at least the vehicle has been in that vicinity. It also demonstrates any exceptions that are on the route. So it can confirm if roads have been attempted to be accessed or just missed. We can confirm if a vehicle has or has not visited particular roads or locations. And the crews and client can see where the vehicles have been during the day in real time. So we will be able to bring that up and you can see all the waste vehicles around the city moving and moving things. We are looking in the future at looking at bin lifts. So we can actually check the number of properties against the number of bin lifts. So we'll be able to start to understand in real time again how this is going. This is a rapidly evolving uh, field against where we were with our old vehicles. So 
and it was the right move, I believe, for the council to invest in the fleet. We have seen the fleet be well maintained by the contractor, but equally surveillance of the client team is making sure that the, the vehicles now are a year old, they still look clean, they're still being well maintained and they still look looked after. The technology that's on board uh, demonstrates all the different um, exemptions. So if we were expecting to collect 13 bins in a road, it will demonstrate whether or not there's been 13 bins that have been collected in a row. So the dissemination and breakdown of this data, CCTV is quite straightforward. The snail trail is quite straightforward. Measuring bin lift data and linking it through to these back office services is certainly something where we need to start thinking about evolving our business analytics um, and what potential there might be to work with things like AI to start processing that data so that we can understand where the hotspots are in your wall, working with you, and then link that through to your local uh, local knowledge as well. We, I'm familiar with a handful of roads um, in various wards that are continuously problematic, and we would like the, the data to start sort of realising these so that we can start adjusting. Um, in terms of counter inquiries, um, you will start to see some of this information in our responses. We, Some of you may have already seen some of this information in your responses, and we hope that it provides you with not only a thank you, councillor, we've resolved it, this is it. It provides you with a bit more background, and that background gives you more information to engage with the residents, and equally, not necessarily to challenge the residents, but to understand where there, there may be something that's going on that might require a bit more investigation, perhaps. Um, so, Examples will be, you know, reviewing of particular bins that have been missed, particularly we're, we're, we're very fixed on assisted collections at the moment. Um, the, the contractor and ourselves are very focused on understanding where the assisted collections are meant to happen and what, where they're meant to happen is okay. Where the bins are returned to and the identification of that bin is, is, is becoming increasingly more important because we, it, it's uh, something which under the Equalities Act, we're very keen on making sure that we are getting it right first time. Um, so councillors are requested to pass on waste collection, uh, collection related issues as quickly as possible to the service um, because we've got basically five, sometimes four, often three working days to get it right again before it's seen as another failure. And if it's come to you or, uh, and, or it's come to customer services, that, then the sewers might not know about it. So when it comes to waste collection, the sooner we know about it, the sooner we can get that resolved as quickly as possible. And as a result of that, we work with customer services so that there is a daily churn that comes into the waste client team uh, and they will work to continue to process that. Um, the interfacing with the waste team continues through councillor casework, but some of it is really complex and we will engage with you directly when it becomes really complex. And that is something which we feel is necessary because it just, it, otherwise it's going through um, the, the transposition of information, the data becomes lost and it feels that there needs to be access to an expert. Um, and that is often the case with miscollections, contaminated waste or issues where it might need to be referred because there might be residents may have, you know, there might be particular special circumstances that are happening there as to why things are happening. Um, and then equally, it might lead to enforcement as well. And we, we, we do say, is this an avenue where we feel that enforcement is appropriate or if we want to escalate? So we are trying to work with you on some of these more bespoke, individualised cases, um, because sometimes these can sort of generate more heat than light in terms of the amount of work that's required. Um, so, yes, as I mentioned, specialist interfacing and, and complex waste issues um and and customer services will continue to be cc'd in and customer casework will continue to be cc'd in but we are working on the fact that it needs that quick expedition because sometimes we've got 36 or 48 24 hours to get it right uh, and if not it's seen as a second failure and then when we see second and third repeat failures the uh, the attitudes can shift quite quickly as i'm sure we'll be aware of and understanding so that was everything in terms of um just the update on the new technology and, and how we're seeing uh, things change. Uh, David's going to talk about um, uh, now about the performance management framework. Thanks, David. Okay. Yeah, so my brief paper is on um, the performance management framework. So this is one of the tools we've got in the new contract um, to try and incentivize good behaviours and incentivize bad ones. 
we realised we had Serco, the contract management tools we had were limited. I think there was five KPIs. I think we probably got thousand pounds out of them in 14 years. So we realised it needs to have more teeth in the new contract. My team look at things called operating performance indicators, is day-to-day -day stuff like number of trucks going out, making sure it's resourced correctly, making sure health and safety is covered off. But we do realise there's some key performance indicators that you guys might be interested in in terms of recycling rates and miscollection rates, the things we put on the corporate dashboard. We do monitor both of those and we'll talk about them in our fortnightly meetings, monthly meetings, and quarterly meetings we have with um, various people within Suez. The three bits, the three elements of the performance management framework are performance management framework, which is where they fail to meet one of the obligations in the contract. There's a number of points. A number of points are incurred, meet each of the number of pounds. Or something called non payment. So if they say they're going to clean the A5 once a year and don't, we won't pay them for it. And also, if we have then put someone in to clean for us, they'll be extra payment for us and non service deduction. So those three main tools are what we use to manage our contract with, with Suez. As Nick mentioned, that there's a there's a hamster wheel sort of concept, a ratchet concept, and this is if they fail to do something and then they don't they fail to remedy it within a certain time, they'll keep getting hit with pounds and keep getting hit with points. And this is to make sure that even though even though they've had a, a one sort of level of points they've received, it'll keep going around to actually resolve the issue. So keep some honest in that regard too. There's some um, key triggers within the contract too. So these are the really bad thing. They put some in the wrong grave. If they have a certain level of miscollections, if they get um, 430,000 points or more in one contract year, or if we should issue something called little abatement orders when the streets get so clean and magistrate steps in. So if they, they, those things happen, we can terminate or part, terminate parts of the contract. That's quite a good important thing for us. Contract year one for us, that's so September, also can be by until the end of March 24. And we were in discussion with Suez about um, the performance variance in the port management framework during that time. It was a grace period initially, so they had three months basically where there was fewer points and fewer pounds and a lower ratchet. But what we did from, from 1st of October onwards, we actually applied the full PMF for certain key indicators of our miscollections. Incomplete is where we don't finish them they were supposed to. Rectification of miscollections is where you've forced it, we haven't gone back. And the total um, monetary value of the deductions we got for that period, that six month period, was £165,000. So as you can see, the teeth are quite big. So that's in one six month period. This year today, we are have been tracking the performance failures. And um, as you'll see, there's quite a high peak related to that May, June, July period that Nick spoke of. And these the main failures have been in miscollections, have been in overruns, have been in incomplete collections. So we're still tracking these. They have been falling away quite rapidly in September and October. Um, there is scope to review them with, with, with Suez. If we don't think the PMF is driving the correct performance, there is scope to negotiate with them, but this time we don't tend to do so. But as you can see, there's quite a lot of points being accrued this year to date as well. That's in figure three of my, my report. Thanks. So, any questions on those two reports? Perhaps somebody who hasn't asked a question yet. Yeah. Anybody else? Oh, okay. off you go. That's a long time. <laughs> <laughs> um, can you just clarify what happens when somebody reports a misconnection that you didn't know about and it appears to be genuine? Because we, there used to be a rule that you've got to report that within 24 hours of the end of the collection day. I'm not clear whether that still applies. Um, when they would expect the team to come back, or do they get feedback that it is not deemed to be a mistake? Yeah. Because I'm guessing a lot of people are saying, I report it, nothing happened. Um, so you can report a miscollection from the moment that the driver driven past the house, thinks he's collected it and hit I've done it. At that point, someone can ring up or go online and raise a miscollection. There's no way until five o'clock you can do it almost instantly. From that point, the contract has 48 hours to go and remedy it. When you report from the report it. So they should, they should doesn't apply on Sundays, but there is a miscollection call on Saturday. So if you report on Friday, it should be done on Saturday. So there's a day off on Sunday, we let them have a day off. Um, so they get that 48 hour period and when they've had that 
this collects and resolved, and the crew have gone back and said, I've done it, should ping an email back to the residents saying it's been, it's, been, it's been resolved. If it hasn't, then we'd expect them to escalate as a, to a complaint to the contractor or a complaint to my team. Um, so that's the process. We can't tell when that 14 ever starts because we can't tell that this bin crew has been told that they've missed it. So that can lead to people taking their bins in because they think they've given up. Um, and I don't know whether there's any way of dealing with that. Um, you know, I had the case of the water law, for instance. They turned up on the Monday after it was reported on the Thursday. I think it hadn't got through to them till late on Friday, so they were within the 48 hours, okay. but we didn't know that, so they'd take their bins back in. <laughs> they can't leave them out indefinitely, no. particularly if it's sacks, not bins. <laughs> Correct. We would recommend if you put a misdirection, leave it out, so it's at, least, at, least, at least 48 hours, at least two working days, and we'll get back to you. If it's, if it's not after that, then I'll suggest I'm calling again and we're reporting it again. But, um... <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you, Chair. Just a uh, quick one, maybe. So in terms of performing the collections, um, I know at the beginning of it was a bit of a TV problem because we could have taken up with you we nearly one year down the road now. Would you say you're comfortable with the collection coming 99.9% or would you say 100%? Mm -hmm. the, mis the miscollection performance could be better, um, but as Nick said, we're striving for 75, but probably touching around 100, 100,000, so it's quite a good success rate, not 9.9%. So um, we can do better. I think we'll hit 75. Uh, I think we'll probably already hit it in October. To be honest. Thank, thank you, Councillor. I think it's, it is worth mentioning that <clears throat> the overall performance and attitude of the new contractor has been refreshing. This level of data, the transparency of information, the new technology, um, their, their overall application to health and safety and leadership has been good. We're, we're pleased. Um, what we've noted now is that because previously we had a clear all system, if the, the sack goes out and it's no longer the resident's problem, it's part of the great sea of sacks that are out there and the legacy contractor, which their job was turn up, clear all the sacks and go. So now if, so it, we, we didn't have the miscollections were a problem, but they would affect more people because there's these sacks. Whereas if we miss a bin, that is now a quite individualized, tailored issue to that resident. And what we're finding is while the performance may be 99.99% or 99.95%, depending on uh, the, the level of frustration for those individual cases is, is actually a bit more intense. Um, so I think that what's been mentioned by the committee tonight about focusing on early resolution, earlier intervention to reduce a the number of first times that we miss it, but the quickest way possible to get to those bins and get them emptied. That's what's going to drive a better performance, as you say. The performance on paper is very, very good. But when you've got a handful of issues in your ward regarding missed collections, sometimes that your perception of things is the reality, isn't, isn't it? We don't see all the success, we can only monitor and, and observe the failure. And I think that that is going to have to be the defining piece of year two. Um, it's going to be making sure that we don't have these major spikes and making sure that we can intercept those <coughs> issues early and get them resolved. And if we can get to this meeting for year two, reflecting on that, I think that is we'll definitely make some very firm steps for this service. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Yes. Thank you, Chair. So we that so we have lots of data, and I agree with you. Great data from Suez, and we can judge very well or harshly whether we enjoy working with them. Do they get anything? Do we get feedback as to whether they enjoy working with us and whether we're doing a good job from their perspective, or could they do anything better? Thank you, Councillor. That is an excellent question. Um, I think they have positioned themselves so that they have set out Milton Keynes to be similar to the legacy contractor, their flagship contract. We are in competition with the Royal Borough of Kensington and Chelsea for that status, but they seem to reflect very positively on their working relationship with us. They do see us as a, as a city that 
puts these services front and centre. Um, we are looking oh, back in December, talk to you about forthcoming procurements uh, regarding our waste disposal infrastructure. And we would hope that the relationship is in a position whereby they would be interested on to expand on that relationship. Um, so thus far, it seems to be very positive. Um, I think that what will define that relationship will be the application of the PMF. Um, and, you know, if it's too sharp, how they will respond to that. Um, but for the moment, uh, while we're in the we're not in the honeymoon period anymore, certainly not. We are now in a position whereby they have to firm up their role for the next four years. Because unlike previous contract, which was seven plus seven, uh, and the last few years felt like they were dragging, we are now three and a half years away or the next before whether or not we choose to extend this contract or not. So we have to keep them true to their word. But they, they seem at the moment, I think maybe even Stuart comment, he's in contact and Michael Bracey is in contact with their chief executive on, on that relationship and probably maybe even better place to comment on it than I am. But it seems positive at the moment. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Nick. Yeah, we, um, uh, Michael Bracey meets with the UK chief exec of Suez on a um, five, six month uh, basis. Um, yeah, their, their feedback of us is that we are uh, a very mature client, uh, a grown up client. Um, we work with them, you know, we, we, we don't go into uh, an adversarial approach, which is, I think, uh, has really benefits actually already. Um, you know, I, I know we're not going to talk about mobilisation, but this was the speediest uh, mobilisation they've had um, for many, many years in terms of reaching a steady state. I know um, you know, a number of you in the room that were in contact with us when the Eurozone took place. That wasn't easy, but it wasn't easy because of the amount of change uh, that we undertook. But um, yeah, they're very complimentary about the way in which we manage the contract compared to some of their other uh, clients. I'm saying right, mainly other clients, but they generally see us as uh, good to work with, uh, mature. Um, yeah, and somebody I think that, that they certainly would use for case studies of how to do it and how to do it well elsewhere. That's a, that was a great question. I think that's a very corporate answer in terms of I'll have to um, uh, do, do the admin control, manage performance, but also Mighty have to manage a relationship with people on the ground. So um, Mighty were very close in, in, the, in the right ways with people from Suez. They have an open door policy. We meet fortnightly at least um, for formal meetings, but we're sort of talking to them daily, get daily reports from them. At a supervisory management level, my team are very engaged with Suez. And a lot of them also know people who work with them on, on a personal level. So I think there's a right balance of, as Nicholas Stewart said, the corporate interface is there. But the day to day interface is a lot of very much important, and we do manage them as well. I um, just wanted to make a quick suggestion actually, because hearing some of the comments about um, the, the time from reporting to resolving the list collection, and I'm sure many councillors will experience the same that, 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 that very often when you, you find out about an issue in your ward, it's the person who's decided to put on Facebook, Has anybody else's been been missed? Or they email their councillor directly and because you haven't checked your email that afternoon, you don't see it till the next day. And then that's, you know, kind of like 24 hours before you pass it on to anyone else. So it was just really a suggestion could social media people maybe ramp up the, the use of the report it function to actually get? Because I assume that that message is then going direct to Suez and instead of going around the email trail, which would maybe speed things up a bit. Thank you, councillor. Uh, and I think that that's a very good comment and certainly one that we'll take on board. Uh, and we, we need to start thinking about our interface, our digital interfacing, I think. And we, there is a, an environmental environment and waste customer services improvement board, which is looking at things like apps and, and staff technology, which could really help to uh, expedite those inquiries and, and resolve quicker. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, just wanted to find out on the flip side, we were talking about swear stops and for about our residents, non-compliance from residents, breaking the rules. Do we have any data regarding those or assistance offenders in different parts of the world? What do we have coming back from Swiss? Thank you, Councillor. <clears throat> We've um through bringing in the wheel bin service. Uh, and the, the huge comms campaign that went out, we have hit a reset button 
which is, is has been excellent. We've seen our recycling rate go from 50 to potentially the mid 60s, which is a huge jump. We've seen our contamination rate fall from 28% to less than 10, and in the red bins, less than five. Uh, it did what we wanted it to do and what it was that the council said it wanted it to do, which is great. However, um, what we have seen is a new set of challenges, behaviours regarding bins being left on the street, bin clustering, uh, access for pedestrians to get around bins. In the same way that we in the, in the city were able to place our waste out in sacks and just have them in clusters and they'd be gone, Unfortunately, that mentality has in some areas prevailed with the wheeled bins. So I would say that contamination may have fallen. Um, we, we haven't had too many instances of strange things turning up in bins because we can tell if they're too heavy or if you know, there's too much in there. And side waste seems to have managed itself through and the houses of multiple occupancy uh, seems to, seem to be working quite well where they've got bigger bins and things like that. So it is around bins on the streets. And I think that that is probably going to be the focus of the team working to resolve bins on the streets. And just the attitude of once the bin is out of the house or out of the, the curtilage of the property in, and it's on the street, that the way that they're returned by the contractor, but then equally the way that they're presented by some of the residents is not great. Some roads, every single house presents the bin on the curtilage of the property with the handles facing out and it looks like a military presentation. But in some roads, we're afraid that the bins are presented out and they are clustered and it's really difficult for access and there's some challenges there. That is not uncommon, that's a story across the United Kingdom, but I think it's one that we could look to engage early before those behaviours bed in uh, and it's become you know, second nature. Thank you. In that case, could there be some kind of leaflet? Because I think we don't need to read educate them, but we do need to remind residents. So could there be a leaflet with that kind of information? Because me, even as a councillor, I wouldn't have thought about putting the handles on the outside of the I wheel it out because I struggle anyway. Yes. But I just look so something with that information might be an idea just to my residents. Yeah, thank you, Councillor Smith. Um we're looking at refreshing our first tranche of leaflets, having the original batch being for a new service and all these sorts of things. And I think presentation is definitely going to be one that we're looking at just to provide those. The, the, the handles facing out is a real nice to have, um, but equally just on the curtilage of the property and what to do ifs um, and things along the lines of a city's collections will, will be really helpful. So thank you. Yeah. Any more questions? If not, thank you both, David. Oh, sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, I just would like to know, I thought this was an excellent report about my entire service. When I went to, I normally have loads of questions, <laughs> loads, ridiculous amounts. And there was so much good information here, but also it was very candid. There has been problems, and I love the way that you address them, you've been very honest about them, but you've had a very proactive um, attitude to resolving them too. Um, so, and even colour coded the bits he wanted us to pay attention to, so that works. Um, but I just, uh, and, and I think it's also important to celebrate success. I know as councillors, we always hear about misspent bidding collections, but I think it's also easy to get it out of proportion because I might hear from two or three people a week. That means there's thousands who think the service is really good, and I think that's also worth noticing what's being done in a really short space of time on a mammoth project. So I just want to say thank you for the report and also there's some bloody good work here. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. You said we were going to have a, a discussion and comments. Is that yes, good? yes, well, I'm hoping we can move on to that fairly soon. Right. You have to move on to item two. So and I was I was going to say that in fact Alison's comments take us on very neatly to the comment stage. Um, and um, so, who would like to kick off with comments, suggestions, anything that we might want to report to either officers or cabinet? Um, reminding ourselves that um, Nick did ask us for feedback on um, the double, double um, red and blue bin collection at, at Christmas. 
So, <laughs> oh, excuse me. Um, so that might be something to start with. But but anyway, if people could could kick off comments, suggestions. Let's 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 get on with it. Thank you. Okay. Um. Firstly, I would say yes, particularly given the problem with the late delivery of the wrong thing and the unknown national limit. They have done a fantastic job of coming out and getting the service in place. And I think we should recognize that. Recognize that they got to a good level of performance in April before payment started again. <laughs> um, I would comment that the communication with councillors was almost non-existent over the summer. I remember one statement that they've got a lot of sickness, and it was it. And yet you're saying you've got identifiable problems with you producing an adoption of the bill monies for four months, and we will not be involved, so it's impossible for us to manage resident expectations. If you don't tell us, we can't help you. Okay. Um, so I would like a request that councillors are kept better informed in the future. Um, I've got three requests for more information, not now, but to follow on, please. One, could we have a, a jargon translator for the diagram on page 12, please? Um, this is the app one, okay. and I don't understand the parts of that one. I thought a lot of the letters in the past, but I can't remember them now. Um, secondly, could we have a key for the tracking diagrams? So we've got combat and blue and green dots there, and I've no idea what any of those mean. And thirdly, could we have that breakdown of reasons for myth collection and, and a, a, a similar graph to the one you've got the performance, but with the myth collection broken down so that we can see the scale of the various things? Yes, okay. that's what we can we can do that. Okay. Um, on this one question, what is the service obligation for the percentage of points there? Or the it in the miscollection flow? You give us the target, but that's not the service obligation. Is there a service obligation now? Um, David's double checking. Uh, <laughs> uh, so, just off the top of my head, I'm trying to make, but again, to, sorry, to north and seven, to north and 730 collections. Missed a month, it, you get no performance points. Then beyond that, okay, there's so it's, it's so, a performance scale rather than an option. Yeah, and the 730 was it. Okay, the 730 was picked. You've got that in there. Yeah. Okay. Um, I would comment personally, I don't think the escalation is working well enough, but it may also be customer services recording of it. Because either most of those bad cases are in my ward. Or they are not recording what I'm saying properly, even though eventually you have got to hear about it. As for instance, you've only got two misconnections and uh, missed assisted connections for five times. I recorded two. And that was after the residents had recorded and recorded and recorded. Something was going on with the debt. And it's the same for the other things that again I've I've had that number of bad cases. So you are under recording what is coming into you somewhere. And I think they need to look at it because we can't possibly expect a series to deal with problems that never get to <laughs> Okay. Um, and the final comment I'd make is that if you've got contamination down to less than 10%, you can do less than 5%. Yes, that's right. That is a really good success of the publicised um, you know, There's a lot of good stuff. But I'm concerned that the repeated problems are not being escalated fast enough and effectively. You know, at least public health has it, not just nuisance. Oh, sorry, one final one. The clustering of DMs, you do need to be aware that in some cases there is no room, at least when the car is still in place, to present the bins as you want. I and mean, I do not have enough frontage to have my car and three bins. <coughs> so, Two of them have got to be behind each other, or they block the pavement. And there's yes. an awful lot of cases in my ward where that's true. So, you know, we need to be sympathetic on that one. Oh, yes, yes. <laughs> okay, and I've yet to see a single tag on a single bin. Are they in use or not? Some people say they have seen them, but then they stop. What's happened? Okay, and, and I think that it, it will be worth us revisiting. No, none of the cruise scouts do a bad job. 
but some of them get up and do better jobs than others. Some of the crews are very fastidious in the delivery of, you know, deploying them. And I think it would be worth us just checking that there is a consistent deployment of the service across all 65 vehicles. We have to remember that's the scale that we're sometimes talking about, 65 vehicles that deploy every day, each with three men to crew on. So, yes, we will check that, think that then there is that equality of service in the area. Okay, thank you. Okay, that you'll find me finally. <laughs> Thanks. I'll start with my feedback on the Christmas collections. Also, I'm sure there are some households that have more of a need for blue collections that week. There are more cardboard boxes in my house to remember what children I have. So I was really happy that there was a red collection. Uh, and you said at the beginning, I think, you didn't get much feedback on it. That means it's good. Yeah. <laughs> it's in the council. Uh, so definitely, let's not do away with that. Um, I'm not sure I could have survived without at least a red collection in that week. And I think I kept some in the garage for the next week myself, personally. But yeah, I think we were generally happy with that. My just more general comment, and it is, you know, my, my question was weighted towards this as well. I know there are teething problems, and this is sort of similar to what Councillor Andrew is saying. I, I, I know there are teething problems with the new contract, and of course they were going to be, and Stuart, you've been emailing my board colleagues very regularly about certain specific issues. However, my feedback from the doorstep would be this the way it works now is a significant step on from how it was two years ago, three years ago. Um, I think residents are happy with the read in system generally, um, and they, they are generally happy with the performance. Um, and so the reason I'm asking questions about how does Suez feel about us is because I would hate for us to be difficult with them, lose them. And, uh, you know, the way that you describe the partnership working is great. And I think we should concentrate on that uh, so that in three and a half years, when it comes up again, we can drive something even better for the next period of time, whatever that is. Thank you, Councillor Montague. And I'm, and I'm keen to ensure that it's expressed that the waste collection service, although the dominant front line poster child of the contract does not overrule the street cleansing, the landscaping, the, the tree work, the burial system, all the extra work that happens. And I'm sure that I'll be back in due course to talk about those elements of the service. And it is always the case, I think, that the defining position of the contract is often the waste collection service. And if the waste collection service is operating normally, the contract's fine. But throughout this whole time, even when the waste collection service was struggling, the legacy contractor would always borrow from those other services. Because we need we need street cleansing operatives. We need, and then you'd have problems elsewhere. So this didn't do that. They did they did recruit additional staff. And um the street cleansing services, and obviously it's you know half of the service is waste collection, but the other half is all of the other services I just mentioned. Um <clears throat> so yes, the the con the waste collection service uh is a huge part of it but I'm trying not to let it define the waste collection, the, the environmental services contract quite so much um, because there is there is an awful lot of staff. The other half of the staff that turn up from Alberton to work up every day, go out on mechanical sweeping vehicles, cutting the grass and doing all sorts. So it's, it is good that we try and ensure that the environmental services contract is not just seen as waste collection. So that's really helpful, thanks. Any other general comments at stage? In that case, can I pull out? Oh, as, <laughs> in that case, can I pull out some of the things that seem to come out of the questions to see if they uh, go on? Um, you started you know, talking about the relationship between um, complaints and, and there seems to be, and you were making make the point, it's got to be done at speed. Um, is there a general feeling? Um, that perhaps that, that's an area where, where particularly if we work through um, councillor casework, which is heavily overloaded, there needs to be some sort of priority indication so that um, Nick can, can respond to them in, in, in good time. Does, does that sound sensible? Um, and uh, you've already taken on board, I think, the, the two suggestion that we need some, you know, refresher on how to be a good resident. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, there are one or two issues which came up about um, contract terms, bank holidays, mm -hmm. um, and that might be something that, that you might 
want to do what you said you would, mm -hmm. just check with the union and see if that's good. And I raised the issue about um, what you kindly call innovative solutions, um, whether they might be a way of making the job more attractive for people. And I think that's something perhaps that, that we we should um, we should look at. Um, and um, um, I think the general feeling that um, there was a um, the the review was good. The, I mean, the idea of review was good, and we it was well presented for the good information, and we look forward to a similar review of year two, and hopefully with some of the year one problems uh, resolved. Um, um, I think that covers the ground, um, and but I think the overwhelming spirit seems to be that. Uh, as as people have said, that, that though there are problems, you'd expect problems, teething troubles, and then new problems. But generally, um, everybody is is quite happy with how things things are going. Um, Alison, do you want to add anything to that? That summary, the other vice chair. Later, the only other thing I was going to say just for your list was I think there was a request for a breakdown of why collections failed. That's all that could be circulated to the end. Yeah. Any, any more additions to what we might say? Uh, the way this usually works is that then um, Alex and I, I think, Presumably, principally Alex, produced some sort of form of words, which are then agreed um, with the vice chairs, um, and then we put this forward. So, if that if that seems to be the ground that we've covered, um, then thank you all for a good debate on that one, and then we move on to an equally good discussion on item ten, and um, that's that again is I don't have the unit. Thank you, Jeff. <clears throat> Thank you very much, uh, Chair and members of the committee. Um, now intending to present on the next item, which is regarding the Environment and Waste Programme, uh, which has manifested through a scrutiny report, which is pre-decision scrutiny ahead of a proposed delegated decision that is going on the 12th of November regarding reuse and recycling centres. Recycling and Reasonable Centre Programme is a proposed development to be undertaken by the authority from 2024 to 2028. It, um, the scrutiny report that's provided is um, looking at two key components of the council plan, which we said that we would look at regarding reviewing and recommissioning our household waste recycling centres and promoting and championing and reuse of household items through repair and upcycling. The team, which is um, myself and the other side of the waste team, which is the commissioning team, which is headed by Rebecca, have uh, been looking at our existing waste and recycling infrastructure. Principally, that looks at Milton Keynes Waste Recovery Park and the Waste Transfer Station, but also manifests through our three um, household waste recycling centres. We undertook over June uh, through to July a um, programme for household waste recycling centres business justification programme. Uh, the information of which we understand has not been shared with this committee. It is a financial document um, and we will probably be looking for the committee as to steer as to how much documentation we would be intended to share as part of a delegated decision. Um, the, the business cover is, is complex uh, and provides a very large amount of data. The information that's being presented today is on the concept regarding the proposal to migrate towards reuse recycling centres. It's the intention that the authority move towards uh, the consolidation of its waste and recycling, household waste recycling centre network to uh, 
facilities that are fit for purpose and at scale to be able to accommodate future growth within the city. Having done a review of New Bradwell, Newport Pagnall and the Bleakville facilities, they are no longer in a position whereby they can continue to accommodate the growth of the city. They require significant upward investments and they are a, unfortunately, they are somewhat archaic in terms of where they are placed in terms of proximity to houses, their access for, for residents and indeed some of the associated traffic infrastructure that's linked to them. We were able to reduce this demand that was on the infrastructure uh, by through the introduction of the booking system uh, that came about as a result of managing um, space uh, during the COVID pandemic uh, so that we were able to have a safe distancing. That was able to reduce the amount of demand and offset the, the, the requirement for us to move to facilities that were at a sufficient scale to accommodate future growth. What we have here on the slide is the proposal for a recycling and reuse centre in the north of the borough. This is on Colts Home Road and is in exceptionally close proximity to Milton Kings Waste Recovery Park, the Waste Transfer Station, and all of our other associated infrastructure. There is an example. So, can I interrupt you? That's in Old Warburton. It's in Old Warburton. Sorry, sorry. Yes, it's in Old Warburton. This facility, um, as you can see there, would have the proposal would have a separate haulage road for the collection of waste um, by a dedicated vehicle. And then it would also have a separate access for pedestrians and, vis uh, and visitors and vehicles to be able to access uh, and dispose of materials. It's also proposed that as a result of that, we would also be able to recycle more materials. We would be able to have a better offer for our residents. We would be able to increase our, of our opening times uh, so that we can begin to migrate towards a more accessible service. We've had challenges across all of our household waste recycling centres of residents who do not have access to a car, wish to be able to dispose of small materials that they wish to recycle, including small domestic appliances and scrap metal and all, all, all kinds of things. This facility would be a fit for purpose facility that would be able to incorporate future growth and also be able to provide a better system of recycling. There would also be critically uh, a focus on reuse. The authority, has done very well in reducing its landfill rates. It's done very well in making sure it doesn't burn waste and it gasifies it. It has an excellent recycling rate. Our reuse position is unfortunately not where it needs to be. These reuse centres will focus on our ability to extract materials which are still workable, still usable, be able to partner with the third sector, be able to reuse material. It could use materials that could go towards rehoming packs for people that need to move into new homes for starter packs. We dispose of a tremendous amount of weed, which is waste electronic and electronic, electronic equipment. And that is material, working stereos, working TVs, working things that can be fixed or repaired or already still work that can be sold back or even given to, to charities to, uh, to engage with our local communities. Um, <clears throat> the focus on reuse is the principal driver behind these new sites together with our ability to drive and incorporate growth and be able to provide things at much greater efficiency. This is the proposed centre, the North. It is the hope and aspiration of the authority that we'll be able to have this facility operational by 2026. Second reuse and recycling centre is proposed to be in the South, which is down by Anderson Gate, uh, as you can see there, and that is in Snellshaw. Currently, uh, this facility uh, is, oper is operating in a logistics park. Uh, and again, there you can see that this access, uh, this facility, this land is not best placed for the development of residential or development properties because of its proximity to the floodplain. Um, it is an area whereby we understand and we acknowledge that the area may and is prone to potential flooding. This is why the land has not been developed. However, it is not unheard of um, for land to be developed for potential waste site facilities where we can have non permeable, where we can have permeable surfacing. And you can see that in the area where there may be the most amount of uh, potential flooding in the future, it would be a surface road to collect the waste. And the area that you can see there on the red is a dedicated MK reuse centre that would be in the south of the borough. And as is, as is noted, when we went out to consultation in 2020 to talk about wheeled bins, 
there's very much a focus about with pins. But we also asked about what the support would be from residents for a dedicated reuse and recycling centre in the south. And there was more popularity for that than there was for the wheel pins at 79%. We'd also be looking to dedicate, create a dedicated reuse centre, which whereby we would partner with the third sector and we would be able to offer materials that otherwise would have been disposed of uh, or, or placed for recycling back to the residents. And you can see there it's an element of car parking so that it's accessible to residents, whether it be pedestrian or whether it be by car. This, we feel, will be a dedicated premier frontline offering to our residents and will drive reuse to the very heart of waste management. It's looking for this to be operational by 2028. When um, we took a delegated decision on the 26th of August, which intended for us to bring together the management of our waste transfer station, currently operated by BIFA, and the management of our future household waste recycling centres or reuse recycling centres, as we'd like to refer to them, because that would be their principal term, to be delivered by a single contractor. And that will drive significant efficiencies and financial reductions for the authority. One of the principles is to do the right thing through reuse. Another one is to absorb growth. This program does also deliver some considerable savings for the authority, which can be delivered within the medium term financial plan. <clears throat> that does mean, however, that some of our existing infrastructure might not be fit for purpose. I'd like to make the committee aware of Newport Pagnell Household Waste Recycling Centre, which is um, currently where our commercial waste is placed and was um, developed around about 1992. Uh, it is adjacent to what will be the Tickford Fields development and also to a new development, I think which is Rando Close. New Bradwell, we did look at the consideration for turning New Bradwell into a super site. Um, unfortunately, uh, the topography of the site and the enclosement of it all, and equally the way that it's accessed off the road was unfortunately not fit for purpose. As part of the business case, um, we looked at the potential to expand New Bradwell into become a super site or a reused recycling centre. Unfortunately, it was not viable. So that facility uh, would also be rescinded. And then finally, Bleak Hall has done a great job over the years. It's a very small site and serves the entire south of the city. It has been over capacity for quite some time. Um, it is less than more half an acre, that facility, um, and is on part of the very busy Chesney Wold estate. It is a difficult estate to access. It has created considerable queues and it's been very difficult and we've not been able to offer the ability to expand, we've not been able to offer the ability to um, absorb growth or to offer the things that our residents are looking for, more things that can be required for pedestrian access. Or, and reuse. So it is proposed that those three sites would close and that we would look at what the alternative uses for them may be. Just some case studies. Um, so Cambridge Shear, um, Sunderland and Suffolk have all pursued this um, and the, the costs have varied, you know, 4 million, 5 million, 2 million, uh, and each has got its own different focus. So Cambridge Shear focused on environmental improvements, acceptability, a reuse shop and pedestrian access. Again, very much centre of what we would be looking to do. Sunderland, they went with one big super site. We did, as part of our options appraisal, look at one big super site. Um, it would make the drive times a little bit more hard, harder for everybody uh, because we did look, we did a drive time study, and the, the government recommendation is that it's within 15 to 20 minutes, it's best practice. And that would have, if we'd have put one in the centre of the city, uh, it would have. Um, not being within 15 or 20 minutes for everybody, whereas having one in North and one in the South did. Uh, however, they did, and they went with a large number of visits, so one million visits annually, um, and they went for a large amount of parking with no steps to accommodate, again, the future growth of Sunderland. And then Suffolk there, uh, a slightly smaller site, um, but they looked at a raised platform. So in terms of access at the moment, if you go to our sites, you have to do quite a lot of the heavy lifting. Uh, the new raised access sites, you would literally, you drive up, and you take it and then you just move it and it goes into a container that's there. So that's a split level access. So in terms of able bodyment and access and being able to work with the staff, it is a lot better. It's a lot more accessible uh, and it really works. Um, 
Uh, there are some benefits. Uh, as I mentioned, the split level facility is more accessible to make it easier for people to put items directly into containers without the need to climb the stairs. Bristol have introduced a reuse shop, the Leeds NHS Trust, um, where they've got some of their waste disposal facilities, they've linked it, they've introduced a solar canopy. So I'll look in a little bit more detail around how the assembly plan works in the northern site, but they're able to effectively take their sites off the grid and they can power themselves. And it really does start to tell a story because these sites are the beacons of performance sometimes for our services for residents. We collect the bins, but then when there's big items, there's something there. So I just want to talk a bit, little bit around how it works within Warburton. And so there's a, a sort of a justification for evidence why the northern site would be where it is. As I mentioned, the southern site is somewhat different. It is on a site um, which would be a site that hasn't been developed previously. Um, and there would be a dedicated planning application that goes through for that. The northern site, however, does require exposure of water to smaller sites to create a bigger site. However, the driver is not only the ability to deliver a bigger site, but also all of the benefits that come from haulage and logistics. So at the moment, we have two sites. We have residents taking all of their waste to those two sites. All of the waste needs to be bulked up. It needs to be hauled. All of that waste needs to be bulked up together, and then it needs to be bulked and taken to either, where well, you can see there, you can see Bipa, where we take our waste to be either be shredded so it can go into Milton Keynes Waste Recovery Park, or it needs to be put into more separate containers. So you put them into these sort of row row containers, and then you have to put them into 18 yard arctics to put them onto the motorways. If, however, everything was being brought to a single super site, we would be able to bulk it there, effectively running a haulage road, and then it can go straight in. So the, the benefits of this program is that at the moment, we are spending a considerable amount of money on haulage and bulking of our waste, simply move it from one place to the next. This way, we'll be able to bring everything to one place and we'll be able to put it straight into the recovery park or straight into the waste transfer station. We would also have all the benefits of the co-location. So we wouldn't have necessarily two different contractors running out of two different areas. We would have uh, one contractor operating out of the waste transfer station, and then they would also be operating this facility as well. So you get all of the benefits of bringing the services together and making sure that there's alignment and all of the synergies that come from having a single contractor manage some of our waste disposal infrastructure. And that's why we're proposing we've got the recovery park, which is a big contractor, the environmental services contract, which is a big contract, bringing together the waste transfer station and these two reuse recycling centres, so the third contractor effectively, the trinity of waste collection services for the authority and eradicating the excess cost that we have in terms of the management fees that we pay to both BIFA and to HW Martins. We also have the benefits of being able to have all of the reduced haulage costs and then all of the benefits of being able to manage it on a single consolidated site it would also be in close proximity to the MKWRP, which is a 24 hour facility. And that's going to give us a lot more flexibility to make sure the bins are emptied, make sure that everything works. And also the residents can see it. My, the team, we live here pretty much, and the residents never see a service and an investment that effectively is to the tune of nearly half a billion pounds. Um, they would actually see as they drove in, they would be able to empty their waste into the super site, into the trip comes to the reuse site. They would be able to drive out. They'll be able to see the landscaping depot, all of the electric charging infrastructure, MKWRP, the waste transfer station, and how it all works. And then, of course, linking to that, you know, any visitor centre that we want to do to make sure that residents and schools are aware. This is how it works. This is how a city manages its waste, manages its energy works with its residents and then promotes it. This is what will deliver part of a big chunk of our sustainability strategy and our energy strategy. So effectively, that is uh, another separate decision that is going on the 12th of November regarding the, what is becoming the Warburton Eco Park. And there is just a summary there of all the various things that are happening to make that a reality. So the re-procurement of uh, MK Recovery Park, uh, number two, uh, the transition to a waste transfer station, what we've delivered uh, at the, the BIFA site there, 
installation of a shredder, refurbishment of the photovoltaics, storage of beams. Then we've got the environmental services depot, um, where we're looking at bringing more electric RCVs. We've got the car park, which has been built. And then we're putting our housing colleagues' vehicles there as well, which is great. Um, and then um, the management of 54 Colts Home Road, so that we've got our landscaping depot there. And then down in the corner, the rider facility, which is currently our landscaping depot, that would eventually move to become our household waste recycling centre, our car park with a potential heat centre on it, our environmental services depot, our waste transfer station and the MK recovery park. And this is something that will engender a sense of civic pride and it's what they do in Copenhagen. This is pretty much what they do. They take all the waste, they recycle what they can, they reuse what they can, they work with the residents, they turn it into energy, they use the energy to power their electric vehicles, their fleet, their street cleansing vehicles, and then they put the rest of the energy into the grid. And we're at the position where we're looking at taking all of the heat from the recovery path and giving that back to the residents and the businesses as well. So and this is this is how we will do it. And we were already pretty pioneering when we built the private wire so that our recovery path could power our electric vehicles. But by bringing on board the, the, uh, the reuse recycling centre and the heat centre, this is what will get us to net zero by 2030. And that is the summary. Um, I recognise that from the committee's perspective, we have presented the concept of the reuse recycling centres. Um, in terms of the business case and financial detail, I believe that that was financial scrutiny because this sits with Councillor Lauren Townsend's portfolio. Um, but again, happy to pick up on any questions as they come through and really to reflect on the concepts and the direction of travel and for the council to and for the committee to comment on this proposed direction of travel and vision. Thank you. Um, Thank you. I, I think the plan looks absolutely fantastic, especially with the cellular with canopies and the recycling as much as possible. It's absolutely brilliant. Um, you mentioned with one of the case studies um, the importance of drive time as a decision to have a north site and a south site. Um, is there any evidence to suggest that the longer the drive time from the site, the more likely there is to be flight to being, for example? Because I'm a little bit concerned that both your sites are on the west hand side of the city and there's significant expansion on the east side. Of the city. So I was wondering if you um, thought that might be a problem. Thank you, Councillor. At the moment, um, we looked at the catchment areas by 10 minute, 20 minute and 30 minute drive times. And where it's felt to be you know, within 20 minutes, there's, there's no concerns and, and everywhere is within 20 minutes, with the exception of a very small number of houses right on the border above Lavenden. Um, so at the moment, that is not a concern. What we want to try and do is ensure that there is a greater offer to residents and increase the convenience of um, having longer opening hours. And there will be some marginal convenience for some residents who are in proximity to one of the smaller household waste recycling centres. But as you can see from where these new ones are placed, they are in industrial areas, um, off of direct grid roads, and they are all currently in the northern area, they're all very well screened. And in the southern area, there is an element of screening as well. So that's the offer that we want to be able to try and deliver the reuse elements, try and get people to recycle little and often when it comes to bulky items, but equally for them to participate and get involved in reuse by partnering with the third sector and getting that repair element involved, we can really start to see a transition from waste to recycling to, to reuse. So we're hoping that that amplified offer will actually you know, detract from any, any flight tipping. And equally, we're looking at there being a way bridge in the north and a way bridge in the south, because currently we've got one way bridge at Newport Pagnell, um, and we'd like to look at potentially the opportunity to open a way bridge in the south, which given uh, the number of contractors and um, businesses that operate in the south, we think that'll be a great offer. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Wolfton, where I represent, has one of the lowest car ownership. So being 20 minutes away is no good for us. Um, what we need is bulk collection to be a lot cheaper because other, we have seen an increase in flight yeah. 
mm-hmm. which we deal with ourselves with cameras and stuff. Um, without cheap bulk collection, I think the fly tipping is going to go through the roof. Thank you, Councillor Smith. I will. I think that as a result of this program, we are definitely keen to make sure that we can offset bulky waste service and looking at what the cost profile is. It's been a while since it's been revisited and it's certainly something which we're happy to look at uh, again. Um, I think it's a set, it's outside the scope of this, but it's one that we, we, I, I would be happy to, to get into that a bit more now because well, I haven't had the chance to do so since I've been here. So it's been a while, so it'd be good to look at it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for providing a bit more context that's in the document because um, the document itself quite concerns me because it felt completely light in detail. Um, I couldn't see from what was being presented what's the problem that we're trying to fix. Mm-hmm. We've added some context about saving money on haulage and things, but again, before that, I couldn't see anything. And you talk about three sites that uh, are currently in existence but again I can't see that there is a capacity problem I've never heard of any residents and having cleared out two houses of late and gone to New Bradwell I've never had a problem what I have had a problem with is having to wait and use the booking system um, so I think it concerns me that the, the document says we want to spend a lot of money to do some stuff mm. rather than actually anything of any any great um, substance um, and again, look at some of the case studies, fabulous other places have spent millions of pounds on it, but what have they achieved from it? Again, what problems did they fix and what are we trying to do by doing this? Um, and I think the comment that this would then be looked at, I'm, I'm glad here, I knew there would be a business case. Um, slightly disappointed that the comment was made, but then any financial aspect of it would go to the financial scrutiny then what's the point of bringing it here? Because I thought, even if it's a concept stage, it should be something that we should look at. And I can't possibly support something when I don't know what it's going to achieve and what problem it's going to fix. So um, I just wondered if you had some thoughts of how we could resolve them, because at the moment, my feeling is I'm going to reserve any opinion on this until I can actually see information that would allow me to say, absolutely, bonds are brilliant, or can we rethink? Thank you, Thanks. Councillor Angie. No, and that's that is helpful because trying to pitch something of this scale, it was it would be nice to focus on the concept and the vision. Uh, but then equally, if the vision looks appealing, where's the detail? Um, so I think that we we've been trying to balance myself and Rebecca the level of detail that we provide, um, and I think it would be helpful for the committee to steer. You know the, the the amount of detail that is provided regarding this. Um, there's an options appraisal. A situational analysis was undertaken regarding the existing sites. As I mentioned, in terms of um, the current bookings, um, the sort of not far off capacity of our current booking system that we can offer, um, and this would effectively double the capacity. Um, but equally. In terms of the presentation around the savings, so there's a saving in terms of management fee, there's a saving in terms of bulking and haulage, there's a saving in terms of them bringing the contract together. All of that is provided within the business case. So I appreciate that it would be a case whereby we might need to come back with, with, with all of that detail. And I, I think that the discussion was really about appealing to the committee about whether or not this is the direction about which we should go. Bearing in mind that I've highlighted it would deliver savings, it would accommodate growth. Um, there's a potential for the existing tariff system on you know various developments to fund this. Um, and then equally, there's also the additional money that we have to spend on the facilities, the existing facilities. Even if we the do nothing base case, we still spend two million pounds on the existing facilities. So I I understand that. Um, Myself, we, we, we need to think about how it is that we present that level of detail um, and and where that should go in the appropriate forum for it. So, um, Stuart, yeah, yeah, thank you, Councillor. There's um, we've had 
uh, sort of fairly significant disease before on things like MKWRP, where we've got the pre briefings. Um, you know, the decision is not far away and the papers are not far away from being published. So, um, you know, any general comments, as Nick says, are, are greatly appreciated today. And um, that, that may be something that we're happy to take that away and talk to the uh, cabinet member and say they're happy for us to do that. But I think on the basis of your comments, that would be a good thing to do to give as much. Uh, much briefing and as much information prior to the decision as we can. Yes, John. Sure. Yeah, that would be great because, again, from my point, it really starts to irritate me when I hear people are, I'm being asked to make decisions because it's going to do more and much more. It's going to save money. Great. £3.50 or £350. It makes a difference to whether. When it comes before us, I'm happy to go brilliant. As, as you know, it's a nice presentation, but I would say that I cannot say that I'm for or against because I just don't have enough information. Okay. Yeah. Um, Sorry, go ahead. Sorry. Um, so, those two super centers we were about to build. So I think uh, my colleagues uh, Tracy Trust earlier on, someone living in put pad down, but I think about having hardly minute to come here, or do they want to fly to things in a mindset. Uh, as a given growing city, um, in next 25 years, we expect it to be half a million plus citizen. Do you reckon those two super size will be enough for one take anymore? I mean, given take, you are looking at 2028 and 24 to be back for services. Thank you, Councillor Khan. The, the super sites as built will be, you know, sufficient to take our growth beyond 2060. So, you know, we are looking at building something that is going to be fit for purpose. When three sites were delivered in the early 90s, uh, they were effectively sort of shoot. The new Bradwell was forming a gas works in the Victorian times. New <laughs> Bleak Hall was a bit of leftover land from creating the industrial centre. They were shoot shoot warned in effectively so these two new sites are to accommodate the future growth of the city and to create a better offering with the focus of of the reuse um and then equally the way that the current contract for household waste recycling centers work is it's a fixed fee per site um so it is a case of although now we may be paying it's effectively five hundred thousand pounds per site management fee to the contractor um, by going to two super sites you won't make half a million pound saving but you'll make a considerable saving because the two sites are bigger but the initial direction of the council was to build a fourth site equal that was probably a little bit more convenient so then you've got all of the extra haulage costs all of the extra bulking and that was too big but you know was, was initially in place in mk east so you've got a crossroads here in terms of the strategy do you go with a devolved almost like a smaller asset that's local, hyper local asset, or would you go with a more regional scale facility that is accessible but is more functional and has greater use from a commercial perspective as well? Um, the opportunity in Wolverton, um, where we've seen assets at scale, so in Surrey, where they've got their gasification plant, and um, in Glasgow, where they have their gasification plant. Both of them have got the household waste recycling centres appended. It was a missed opportunity. We were very busy in 2014. It didn't quite catch there, but we have managed to get an opportunity where we've been able to place this adjunctive piece of infrastructure and it will be able to absorb the growth. And the campus as is should take us beyond sort of 2060 to 2070. So yes, it will be able to continue to absorb the growth of the city. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Firstly, I'd say I grew up in Coventry and they had a site which was only specially, but it had the sense of a customer experience, people took it, and it was good. I was fairly horrified when I came here and first tried Wolfton and decided I was never going back and, <laughs> and then tried the others, which were better, but not good. Um, so I can see that sort of benefits, and they also used to have reuse on the and back on site, and it would be great to have that back again. And certainly, that's something a lot of my listeners are talking about. Um, however, I think during Cloud Cooking Round about the trial times, 
Am I right in saying that side is off the A41? It's the suspension side. The suspension is off the A41. Yeah. Well, that, We're actually that got to one an way. absolute traffic jam in the rush hour. It used to be bumper to bumper. There's no way you could get through to that in a waste of time. No, that's not something that has been raised. Yes. Well, I think you should go and talk seriously to highways and investigate that because mm -hmm. I'm really seeing this. There used to be a 10 to 15 minute difference in the time I could get to my old ward in Thurston from Monkston, depending on what time of day it was. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I would question the viability of, of the transport there unless they've done something massive to reduce that, but I'm not aware of that. Also, it's within the range of the area that where the roads were closed on big bold concert. So how can you get through there? If you, but if you can't get through in the evening rush hour, and all from off peak in the summer, I'm not going to go after work. You're going to be in trouble. <coughs> so, oh, the information we've looked at at the moment check that is very carefully. <laughs> yes, and that's certainly something. Uh, that I mean, to say, on board. I, I, it, it takes the best part of 20 minutes for me to get there. Mm -hmm. Amongst them, to say that Woven well, Sounds can get there in 20 minutes, it's clearly cloud good enough because it passes lavender. But I suppose lavender will go to Woolworths. You know, those drive times will get me the subway to Woolworths. Yeah, well, that's the thing. Yeah, yeah. Well, I don't know if you can get there in 20 minutes. Yeah, well, I don't know if you can get there in 20 minutes. We pursued this in the 2017 waste strategy when I first turned up. There was a proposal that was brought forward uh, to look yeah. at a single super site uh, that didn't work, and that used the same uh, drive time principle. Yeah. So we we will we will. I, I can understand that that should cause too much local congestion. Yeah. And that's very much. Yeah. Um, I would reiterate the problems about the road waste collection. There are a fair number of residents in the city that do not earn enough to drive a car, and those same residents, there's no way they can afford the collection. They've got to do something about it. Because that is where a law from off of the flood. Thank you, Councillor. I, I would agree that a review of the waste, the bulky waste services, is probably overdue because we've been in the, <laughs> the procurement of environmental services. So we're about to head into the for another one and these but yes it's certainly something which i think has been expressed and, and does need to be looked at um that's yeah. fine. thanks okay and then the final point is on finance is i would have thought at the very minimum we need a table even if it is uh, on restricted circulation that tells us roughly what sort of costs are being incurred when and what sort of income will come so that we can see what the bottom line looks like you know, to expect us to be approving anything in that, it's nonsensical. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Councillor. And it was a very, it was a difficult position for us because um, I think when we were looking at bringing forward the, the, the session, today's session was very much going to be focused on the environmental services contract. And then uh, appropriately, we wanted pre decision scrutiny. But the decision is very much on this as being the review of. The council plan proposal of repositioning the household waste recycling centres, um, and it's is yeah. I think on, on reflection, it would have been sensible. But I mean, but, and equally, I would have been more than happy to provide you know the, the business case to be you know eighty pages or so. But the most salient points would have been quite easily expressed. So it was a, the balance, yeah. And of course, with and as I, as I did mention, is you know the waste service does. We are regularly here uh, for dedicated sessions, and this does feel like a potential dedicated session. So I've tried to ensure that there was sufficient visibility pre decision, um, but obviously the level of detail, as always with waste, can never be enough. So uh, I'll make sure that next time. Thank you. Any more questions? If not, I've got uh, one or two. Um, I'm quite excited by the the addition of reuse to the um, to the idea um, but um, <laughs> excuse me um, there are already charities and organizations doing that sort of thing um, how how geared up are we or how how advanced is our thinking about integrating that existing work by Cycle Saviors, for example, um, into the reuse program. 
Um, and given the fact that these sites will be operated presumably by a private contractor. Thank you, Chair. Um, in the same way that we've presented all of the uh, social value work that sewers have been doing under the environmental services contract, we would very much see the partnering with the third sector, and there is a uh, quite fertile third sector for reuse in MK, uh, which is why the council does need to you know, catch up quite quickly, really. Uh, we would see bringing that in um, as, as being crucial uh, for the management of the reuse facility, for repair workshops, for specialist items such as bicycles, but also um, stereos and electrical equipment. Um, we have um, Oxfam's uh, reuse warehouse is based in MK, I believe. So their national bookstore, all of that kind of thing, we'd be able to access and tap into women hospice. All of those, we would be able to start seeing some real social value come to fruition working with the third sector. And, and we see this reuse centre and the repurposing of these sites to focus on reuse has been the key time off in that function. Um, second question, we're the, the council is embarking on um, a new local plan, which will take us to 2050. How robust is the business plan in relation to the way that the local plan sees the city extending? Thank you, Chair. Um, we are in the process of um, working as part of the uh, MK infrastructure program and to define that the council is at crossroads of delivering either localized smaller waste sites or regional facilities and um, we're working with the, the local plan team to say that this is the proposed policy direction of the council to build the, the regional facilities at scale um, and for in particular the northern sites to be part of that eco park hub um, and so we will see them developing in tandem and we will see that as new development, as new properties come online, we'll best demonstrate that, that growth can be absorbed by that infrastructure. I know there was a particular issue. You said that one of your design criteria was to be within 20 minutes drive of, of everywhere in Milton Keynes. But if we're extending Milton Keynes in some directions, and of course we've also got the what I always call the parasite estate sticking on the edge. Um, how um, how robust is that plan against that sort of extension? That is an excellent question. Uh, and I think as part of the, the comments that were raised by Councillor Ferrans, um, we'll probably hit the refresh button on that piece of work to incorporate where the size of the city may be within um, yeah, 20, uh, 20, 40, 20, 50 and beyond actually, because we did it on the existing template, but we will need to inc incorporate, uh, that didn't include MKUs, but it needs to incorporate the energy states that could be bolted on in the future. So we'll, we'll consider that. Should you <laughs> 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 Any, any other questions? Right. Um, well, thank you, Nick, for the presentation and asking the questions. We can now open it to discussion. Um, are there any um, who might like to make some comments on what what we want to tell um, the cabinet member before she makes her decision in a fortnight? If not, can I make some suggestions um, that? I, I don't think there's been much opposition to the the idea the existing um, sites are, are old, small, need new investment and not fit for purpose. Um, so that the idea of, I think the committee is on board with the idea of, of new investment and new investment um, in some way. Well, <laughs> uh, oh, I'm going to put a caveat onto that. <laughs> um, and I say the caveat is that, as I said, that there are some things that need to be carefully examined, like whether the whether the business plan. Um, and I suspect that what we want want to say is that to the cabinet member is to ask is to come back to us. Um, 
for a future meeting with a more robust with a business plan that we can devote to scrutiny um, when the time comes. Um, if that if that meets overcomes your your um, right okay um, and um, but then um, say I think I personally sorry. Sorry, I will just actually interject. I think I actually do want my comments to go a little bit further than that. Okay. I don't support what has been presented this evening. And that, that could just be me because I cannot see what I'm being asked to support. Okay. I mean, usually scrutiny moves by consensus, but we have, I, I, mean, I think we, we can recall that the dissent company on, in, in the comments, yeah, that's fine. Sure. Um, and, so you can't. I just want to say that I absolutely concur with what um, Councillor Adams is saying, but we do need more information to be able to support yeah. fully yeah. what's in what's just been presented. This few gaps there. Yeah. Okay. So it's not just. I think we will recall those comments in the. Uh, yeah, is it gone? The, the combination of both the finance and the transport. Yes, I was going to say that that's another issue that. That was, that was raised and needs to be thoroughly examined on um, scrutiny. Um, I think that um, I raised the issue of encouragement about reuse, um, but a number of councils brought up the, 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 some of the things which would be suitable for reuse um, might be taken if they have a car, can't be because they haven't got a car. So that I think there needs to be a linking with bulk collection so that uh, if people want to fully reuse the reuse facilities they can do that if they haven't got a car. I think that's something we need to uh, make sure it's suitable. It's not just the reuse side of it, it's the fly ticket side of it, so I, I would need to see information about the bulk collection being a full scroll to do this. Absolutely. So I think, I think that's something else we need that we need to uh, sort of tie into the, the program as it advances. Um, and those were the principal comments, I think. So, oh, one more. Go on, Jennifer. Yeah, one more that picks up on something we were saying. I, I would want to say it really is essential that we <laughs> meet the needs of the local third sector and support in them having an oversight. I was saying we've got a problem because I don't think, for instance, when we need the mission of Cyprus workshop in Wellington to probably be there way near the demand that it would get if it is installed as, as the main mm. um, place for this. Quite apart from the fact that we discussed up there, it's start closing over Wolverton, not in So we've got a problem with scale, but they depend on the income they get from the scale they do. So I think we need to very strongly recommend that there is very careful liaison with the third sector. Mm. And they need to meet their need for fundraising while also making the cities need the scale. Because once you make it easy to recycle by those centers, there will be a heck of a lot more comes in. Mm. Uh, so, so. I remember something that was said earlier about the, the delegated decision that's going to be taken on the 12th of November. So, how are we going to get this information? I think I come in there, Chair. I think, um, I know we're talking about coming back to scrutiny, but the reality is there's a decision that we're, we're trying to take. So, um, what I want to do is, uh, if the, uh, yourself, Vice Chair, and the committee, uh, give, take, give the feedback from the committee tonight, which I think has been or really lighter scrutiny than the committee would have wanted to make on the basis of the information that we provided. Mm -hmm. um, have a look again at the information and on the basis of what we uh, plan to table with the uh, decision and then uh, re-look at the timings of the decision and make sure that um, I, I don't think that we can come back within the scrutiny timetable necessarily. You know, we can't make scrutiny fit the decision analysis, but what I'm saying. So it, but we would need, I think, to have more detailed briefings um, with councillors, with more councillors before we take the decision. Um, so we'll take that feedback away. Thank you. Yeah. Well, I think there's enough, there's enough there for our anxiety to, to, to chew on. Hopefully.
and thank you to that individual. <laughs> um, and that, I think, concludes item 10. And then um, item 11 is the work program. Um, anybody wants to add something to it, now is your opportunity, or you can uh, write to um, either of the vice chairs or the chair when we eventually get one. Um, and there will be a, um, a meeting to discuss the future of the program where we can feed that in. So, any comments at this stage? Yeah. Any? Uh, sorry, Chair. Um, yeah, sorry, sorry, Chair. I'm just going to say the, um, on the scrutiny on the 12th, uh, so uh, the MKWRP, so there is a decision soon after that, uh, which is basically which is the last decision of the year uh, for the 17th. So again, that will be quite tight up against that decision. Um, I, I'm not feeling that's the kind of, um, that, that will have the same kind of feedback as it has from this one. So I didn't want to set the committee off on, well, oh, hang on a minute, is that is that doable for the 17th uh, today? I just wanted to highlight there is a problem on decision. And um, again, as I've described, um, you know, with all decisions on KWR, picking you up those cross party uh, briefings to anyone that's interested in that. There is normally a, a, um, a number of councillors that do turn up for that that have, have an interest. So, you know, the same applies as I've just described for uh, HWCs for, for that for that decision as well. Right. But perhaps the best way is, is to um, ask the that if if um, there are answers with particular, particular questions that, that we need to advance in office, if they are asked in advance, then we can do that. That's the work program. And the remaining returns are, of course, information and discussion. So I hope we have all been suitable. Form and that concludes the meeting. Thank you very much.